Welcome to Upthinking Finance, a podcast that offers a unique and discerning view of economics and financial planning. Here is your host, Emerson Fersh. Welcome to another episode of Upthinking Finance. Doors frontman Jim Morrison once said, whoever controls the media controls the mind. Now, I have to think that just about everybody that listens to this podcast at this point is well aware that the media, whether it's uh, online journals, newspapers, television, or social media, um, is completely disconnected from reality in most cases. And so the challenge for us has become how to discern truth and really by, first of all, where to start with where we're getting our information, how to filter that in and of itself to determine what resonates and what doesn't. And ultimately, I think the key part of this is reconciling these ideas and information we're being presented with our own personal experience. And so um, that's the challenge we live in. But What's helpful, I've found, is to get to a point of understanding of how all this started, the hows, whens, and whys of propaganda, and how it's developed and evolved over the years. Um, And so we're really fortunate today to be able to have a guest on who wrote this book, One Idea to Rule Them All, which was referred to us by a client of our firm, Naomi, who's out on the East Coast here in uh, the United States. Um, The author is Michelle Stiles. And so the hope is, is as we have this conversation, that everybody listening will be able to discern uh, in their own personal lives and see the, the tentacles of this, uh, this propaganda machine, whether it's in your own the company you work for, uh, your, the local government you're subject to, or uh, perhaps the religion you're involved with, because I think you're going to find, and, and it may be a little bit disturbing for some people, just how common these principles are and manifest themselves around us. Now, a little bit about the author before we bring her on. As I said, her name is Michelle Stiles. She describes herself as a lifelong reader and explorer of truth. And so her quest in this whole propaganda uh, issue came up when she be, was personally subject to experiencing the malevolent evil, as she calls it, that had overtaken the leadership of an inner city school district in which she had volunteered. And so that's where all this began. Now, Michelle, interestingly enough, is actually a physical therapist by profession. She's written a couple of books in that regard, one called Fast Track Your Recovery from a Total Knee Replacement, How to Eliminate Pain and Pain Medicine the Quickest Way Possible, and the other book, Color and Laugh Your Way to Knee Replacement Surgery. She's also the inventor of something called Flex Bar, which is a recovery tool for knee replacement surgery. Now, she was once told by a university professor that there was no such thing as a renaissance woman and that she should cap her Bachelor's of Science in Physical Therapy and Master's of Science in Exercise Science with a PhD in Sciences. Of course, she promptly decided to complete a Master's of Arts in Practical Theology. And if there's anything I love is a person who's told by the, by the establishment to do one thing and they go their own way. Um, really, it, to summarize this book, it's really written uh, to expose the realities of, of the world we live in in terms of the role of propaganda and manipulation. And really, it's offered to anyone who senses in their bones that something in the world is off kilter and they can't quite put their finger on the source. My pleasure today to welcome the author of One Idea to Rule Them All, coming to us from Tucson, Arizona, Michelle Stiles. Michelle, welcome to Upthinking Finance. Thank you, Emerson. It's great to be on with you and your audience. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. So I guess the thing is, the first thing that struck me with your book is it, it must have, I mean, there's a huge amount of research. I mean, you've just gone, I mean, you cite everything. How long did it take? And is there anything you want to just share with people before we dive in through the process? Because it looks like just a, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, well, I got started um, about 14 years mm. ago. And um, right. there was a, you know, sort of some local corruption that I saw. And I realized this is a pretty small hill to take. And I wondered, wow, what, you know, it was the first time it really came home to me how corrupt Washington would probably be because of how much power is invested there. And so... Um, for some reason, I just said, I'm going to study propaganda, and um, that I just started reading books, and it was really hard to find anything um, that was really illuminating, and I kept going backwards a little bit, and then I hit Creel, um, George Creel, who was the head of the public Com- Committee on Public Information in World War I, and his How We Advertise America just, first of all, it's a provocative statement, you know, it's like, and he's, of course, he's doing a victory lap on how we advertise the war. He's really proud of what he's what he's done, and you know the the idea of selling a war just sort of smacks you um, 
it just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. And so, and he's so uh, excited about all they did, and and, um, and it's jaw dropping to me. And I kept asking people that I knew, D did you learn this in high school? Because <laughs> I didn't learn this, <laughs> and um, you know, and, and really nobody knew. And I thought. Gee, this this is we've got to get this information out, and so that took me down the rabbit hole. I started exploring, you know, it, you know how people do who are you researchers. You know, you just look at the bibliography, and okay. And then I was going back historically to time pieces written from people in that period. I didn't go to historians talking about that period. I went to the people writing at that time, um, and the people who were telling me what they were doing in their own voice. So I I like to call these guys the, the godfathers of propaganda, um, but uh, Bernays, uh, Creel, Laban, and Lippmann. And so one represents sort of, um, Laban is the, the theor theorist, right? Um, Creel is the practitioner, the first demonstration, large-scale, government-organized uh, demonstration project here in the United States. And then um, Bernays was a... Um, kind of a visionary on where this thing could go post-war into the, the corporations. And then uh, Littman was a journalist. Mm. And uh, so I took, just took those guys from each different kind of segment and, and used their own words to try to highlight. And I'm sort of a um, minimalist in terms of I, I'm trying to do the necessary and sufficient amount of information that you need to connect the dots. You know, I'm not a historian by trade or anything, right, discipline, and so I'm not trying to take you into deep dive and confuse you in a lot of extraneous details. I'm trying to take a real high-level view of things and expose that longitudinally across basically the last 125 years. Well, and that's a really good point because <clears throat> ostensibly <laughs> I think that's what – journalism you know is supposed to do is present ideas where people are allowed to come to their own decisions and and clearly mm -hmm. that's i don't know if that ever existed but you know it's a lost art and i think the other thing i wanted to point up while i was listening to you is i i did an interview with a woman called um her name's melissa shimay she's over in northern ireland uh this was probably last fall mm -hmm. uh and, and same thing independent researcher who who gave a great, you know, we had a great discussion about um, CBDCs. And that's the thing I think that's also been shifting is um, getting away from these so-called experts and instead allowing people who aren't afraid to put in the time and the effort like you, um, you know, to present, you know, really a, a, an awesome just case. And you can see I've, any book that I've read, I've pretty much destroyed. So you can see yours is well on its way to losing its cover. Um, but let's dig in because I, I thought... You mentioned the selling the war. Let's talk, you know, if you can, about this the World War One because that that to me, it, like you said, was shocking. It's nothing you learn about, and yet you see the beginnings of of what we're all dealing with today. Right. I mean, Creel was given six point six million dollars. The greatest amount came from a presidential fund. Uh, the rest came from about a million something came from a congressional appropriation. So he had a ton of money when you think of it at that time, right? 1917, 6.6 6 million dollars. There wasn't a channel that they left unutilized to promote their message. So, you know, just to start with, um, they had the, the, the hard news, what we typically think about as facts about the war and what was happening over there. Then they had soft pieces, and they, they were distributing these, so they were, in, in, in essence, syndicating, right, across the platforms. And so the soft news would go to think, places like uh, Harper's and McClure's, right, so these magazines that, that, that were human interest stories, right. Um, then you had a National Service Bulletin that was targeted toward uh, age appropriate for the schools, and that was, was launched across the country. Uh, you had a pictorial department, which was everything, but, you know, you can think of the iconic uh, posters and signs, Uncle Sam Needs You, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. But they also had wall hangings and things that went in businesses and storefronts, and, and they got a lot of volunteer service from many of those great artists of the time, right? So, so in addition to their $6.6 .6 million that they spent, they got a lot of in-kind services from people who... You know, hey, I can't go to war, but I'm patriotic and I'm going to give my time and service instead of, you know, being on the front lines. Um, they did the Speakers Bureau, right? So they had uh, the Four Minute Men that were 
Right. So you're so so what you're doing there, and it's it's really sneaky, is you're taking Washington talking points. They would have maybe one to three um, speeches a month that they would distribute out through this this growing network, ten thousand people strong, um, to basically memorize these speeches and be able to deliver them extemporaneously to the community. Now, what they were doing there is they were borrowing on the trust that those local people had built up in the community. So this didn't seem like a message coming from Washington. It seemed like a message coming from their neighbor who they knew and trusted. So that was huge. Um, so they were called the Four Minutemen. They had the Junior Minutemen that mimicked that same thing but did it at a, um, you know, in a school and a college level. Um, they even had, and I didn't even put this in the book, but they had a war exposition, believe it or not. Um, and that was, Creel, <laughs> he's got a way with words. He, he called this a cross between a circus and the seriousness of a sermon. <laughs> that That's actually perfect. <laughs> Is, isn't it, right? You know, because, <laughs> so it was in 21 cities and they charged a nominal fee and it basically brought the war kind of home in an exposition way to the, the common people. Um, let me just before, because there's, I mean, I, I'm going to have to curb my comments because there's so many places we can go and there's a lot I want to cover. Right. But what was the motivation behind all this in the first place in World War I? Okay. Right. Okay. So the, definitely the motivation was that um, there was significant, and this is something that I really didn't know, there was significant opposition to the war. I mean, Wilson was elected to keep them out. He, he kept them out for his first term. He was reelected to keep them out the second term. There was really, America wanted nothing to do with the war in Europe. Um, it, it wasn't likely to come to their shores. It didn't seem to impact them. And so there was a real need to galvanize public opinion behind the war because it really wasn't there. Interesting. And I got to say, just listening to the little part, I mean, it's like, it's so coordinated. I mean, even yeah. then, you know, you have this idea of, you know, this America and, you know, it, and, and the thing I got out of it was what you just shared was playing on the, um, the sympathies, you know, people's patriotism, you know, mm -hmm. finding their, you know, weak spot, vulnerability, I don't know what you want to call it, but um, right. anyhow, now you mentioned a few other names that came up during all this. Um, I, and I remember Lippman was another one. Walter Lippman, is that right? Mm -hmm. So kind of maybe yeah. walk us through as this thing went on. Uh, do you want me to jump for because uh, because Lebon comes first? Okay, right. He comes at the turn of the century, okay. and he's the kind of the origins of mass persuasion. So let's talk about him a little bit. Yes, before we get to Lippman because Bernays and Lippman are both kind of foot soldiers in World War One. And they, they spring off of that, you know. But Laban is, at the turn of the century, he writes in 1896, and it's called The Crowd, um, a study of um, popular, the popular mind. And it's important to recognize that was, that was uh, translated into 19 languages. So that just set flares up in the sky for me, like pay attention here. You know, late 1800s, uh, that wasn't easy to translate back then. It's not easy now. You know, you have to pay somebody to, to do the translating and then print the thing. And so, um, but basically what he was saying <clears throat> is he was looking at the, the time period and what was happening. And that there was real fractures in the Judeo-Christian ethos of the West, right? You had the origin of species. You had Nietzsche, God is dead. And he's standing on the precipice of the 20, 20th century and he says, it's going to be the era of crowds. The divine right of kings is out, okay? People are not going to galvanize behind emperors and monarchies and such because they don't, you know, the divine right's gone, right? We don't have that anymore. So the masses are getting a little bit unruly, right? And you, you, what was happening in the United States at the late 1800s, you had the muckrakers. People were angry at the capitalists. They were uh, resenting the um, conditions of labor that they were putting in. They had been dislocated from the rural areas back to the city, you know, into the cities for the first time. Um, and so there was a lot of unrest and, and upheaval. And so he said, we're not going to use logic and reason anymore. This is what we're going to do. That's profound, right? It's transformational. He, he's throwing democratic um, uh, representative government out mm. the window. 
because he says we're going to manipulate you in this way and and so some of the things he talks about is appeal to people's sentiment give them their illusions um, repeat things um, af just affirm it's true don't give them any reason just affirm it and reaffirm it right and say nobody in their right mind believes anything else and we see that today I mean, you can read his book and be shocked because it's you know 125 years mm. old and it fits right into the, to today's time period, you know. Um, but he he had all the elements, but they were sort of uh, thrown about in a way that was loose. And I kept looking at that. And the reverse engineering piece of my book comes from Le Bon, where if you say, gosh, if this has staying power for 125 years, maybe, just maybe, he's saying something really important about human nature and how we come to believe things in a community of trust. And when I started to look at it that way and looked for categories, um, that's when I came up with the infrastructure of belief. And um, so things started to, to snap into place. Uh, and, and again, this occurred over a time period of, of 14 years. You know what I mean? It didn't, you know, as I kept studying and, and looking at this and asking questions and, and seeing th different things myself, um, you know, that started to emerge. So he was re he was really really important. Okay, and then in, and so I know we're going to get into some of, of those in a minute. Um, then another principle you brought up was this idea of stagecraft, which you know I mean there's so many different things that stand out, but these are ones that just seem to be kind of foundational mm -hmm. and sort of building to where we, where we are now. Do you mind maybe sharing a little bit about that? Is that right? So that's sort of Bernays's contribution, and so he spins off from the war. And um, he writes this little book, Propaganda. And he's trying to rehab the name Propaganda, by the way. But um, anyways, in that, he talks about teaching new students of PR because he sort of, you know, conscripts that name as the father of public relations. But he says, you're going to have to know what news is. And, and news, you know, what, what news looks and feels like because you're going to be, in a sense, manufacturing news. So what you're going to be doing in stagecraft is taking an experience and bringing it in to, out of the psychic realm into the physical realm. So we kind of, um, when I explain infrastructure of belief, experience is the centerpiece and seeing is believing. So we orient ourselves through reality, through our eyes. You know, and, and, that, and that, that just goes way back, right? You, you can go to Doubting Thomas, you know, people say, I'm going to believe it if I see it, right? And it's highlighted in our judicial system, right? The eyewitness is the is considered, you know, a really important piece toward um, fitting together the truth of a case, right? Eyewitnesses. So, um, so here's what he said you should do. Like, and I'm going to give the politicians example. So, he says, all right, you have a guy, have a politician who wants to lower taxes on on the wool uh, imports coming in, right? And and you know, like. Why do they want to do it? It doesn't matter why, all right? But he says that the, the politician shouldn't go out and just use logic and reason to, to get that passed, get a law passed to change that. What he should do is this. He's going to, in one part of the country, let's say on the coast, let's New York or San Francisco, he's going to have high net worth individuals show up at a function in a cotton suit boycotting wool. Now that qualifies as news. It's highly unusual, right? People go, oh, what's... What's this famous so-and-so doing? Why are they wearing cotton suits? So the, the press is, is clued in on this. They report on it, okay? Now, somewhere else in the country, maybe Midwest, Indiana, there's another group who just have, like, let's say they're, they're middle-class people, and they, they have an issue with the wool being so expensive, right? Things that they can't do. And so then somewhere else, he has a social worker do a, um, a survey and find out that the poor are freezing to death because they don't have wool, socks, blankets, products, okay? So what that looks like to somebody, you know, in America is that this this problem now has emerged into their consciousness through varied experiences that are sprinkled across their, you know, mental scenery of their mind, if you will, right? That's kind of how Littman put it. And so they're, they're being, what's happening is they're saying, oh, this is a problem. It, it becomes to emerge in their consciousness through the experience, right? And that's stagecraft because really 
nothing is real about these experiences that they've encountered. They've been manipulated by a public relations expert. So here's the thing, and I, I wasn't going to get into this, but you kind of brought it up because, okay, no, this is really important because you mentioned in here about experience and kind of one of the things that's come up with some conversations, like with John Waters, I mentioned you before, I, I've, we've had a couple mm -hmm. of conversations with him and you're, what you're talking about is creating experience. And what I'm finding for me and a lot of others are finding your the, the benchmark to really sift through all this stuff that you get into in the book and what we're up against is your own personal experience. That is not, and that of course that's a whole nother thing is how do you discern from manufactured things that have you been fed all your life, right? To genuine mm -hmm. personal witness of things that you cannot deny is from the almighty, whatever is just truth, pure truth that mm -hmm. you build your mm -hmm. life on. And to me, that's kind of the antidote or the, the antidote to some of this stuff is because you can, you know, and I'm finding this and I'm sure you are as well. You, you look at things and are presenting things, but then um, the reality of your own witness and your own experiences as you live your life completely contradicts. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you go back to the infrastructure of belief, what we haven't fully kind of fleshed, yeah, yeah. That, that helps. Like, so um, if you took a number five dice, experience would be in the middle, authority is on the bottom, a social pressure is on the, another corner, and then culture, imagination, and, and words that, that help define the culture and the reality. Now, what's happening is you can't if you think about a small local culture you can't know everything you can't go out and you know learn everything the medicine man knows and learn how to hunt and make the tents and 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 do the flower and so as as society becomes more complex and more diverse you have trusts right that you look to to say well this is what i'm going to believe right experience is number one and you have a small let's say let's say early american Amer most people lived within 10 miles a 10 mile radius, right? What I didn't see myself, somebody I know saw something. And, and so the, the, the experience is, is held fairly close. We're not worried about things 2,000 miles or, you know, 2,000 miles away from us or even, even further, right? Um, so we have a small local culture um, that's high integrity, right? And so if I don't know the answer to it myself, what's the next thing you do? You look to authorities, yeah. right? Let's find somebody who knows something about cars. <laughs> I don't know the answer, right? So you go to your local authority, and in small uh, communities, if that person is a scammer, like a snake oil salesman, he gets routed out pretty soon. He gets identified, and, and he's got to go to the next community, right? So we have this self-reinforcing cleansing mm. of that trust organization, yeah. right? Uh, and then, you know, thirdly, if I still don't know what to do, experience, authority... I'm going to kind of look around me and go, what's everybody else saying and doing? It's kind of like a fail safe. You know what I mean? Uh, and most people are kind of like that, right? Um, I, right? Aesop's fables, right? Uh, the emperor has no clothes. Right. It goes way back, 1400s, right? We're going to just say, we don't want to go out of that mainstream. You know, we want to be the outsider, right? And so um, you can pretty much triangulate most beliefs not necessarily in hard facts, but experience, authority, and social pressure, in my mm. opinion, okay? And so, but the problem is, as you get a technological society, and those trusts, you can't, you know, the news was, was the indispensable um, fourth estate to mm. root out corruption and falsehood in politics and places distance from us, but they, they abdicated that responsibility. Right, and they become part of the elite establishment. I would say, right, and um, so who is routing out? As you get further and further away from you, somebody can say, "Well, this happened in China, and that happened in." Well, we we have no way, except for the news, right, to uh, basically co corroborate those stories. So anyway, so as te as technology gets gets um, further and further away from us and we're shown pictures and we're told a story and we, we, you know, now the internet kind of poked a hole in some of that, right? Because we were being shown 
let's say we had somebody with a camera, an iPhone, live on the ground, and we were being shown a different story than maybe the narrative of the mainstream media. And that started to, to poke some holes in, in their, the strength of their authority. So those are trusts. And what you were saying about experience, you know, how do we tell the difference now? It's a real problem. I mean, I, you know, once this thing has been corrupted, which it has, all right, they're bringing us, and you know, you got to remember too, and I didn't address this in the book, I may in a, in a future book, but you got to remember, the Associated Press was consolidated in the early 1900s. So they not only had a lock on the newspapers, but they had a lock of news gathering, right? So news gathering is, you know, it's like if you only have, um, you know, if these are the pieces that come in as your news, they're basically, they have the power to deem what's important and what shall be neglected any day, every day, yeah. right? So I can select the problems, you know, and that's why I call the news treason treasonous tribal elders. Because somebody in our culture needs to be the ones warning. Like tribal elders would have functioned as this group of wise heads um, who are looking out for the interests of the community. You know, and they're, they're analyzing threats and they're deciding what to do. You know, our politicians have, have pretty much abdicated that, right? And, the, and I would say the news functions as the tribal elders. Because you could have somebody do a speech and they don't even cover it. They don't even cover things that, that happen in committees, right? right? So, so they're basically the ones saying, okay, these are the problems we should attend to. And if, you know, if you have a household and somebody says, yeah, the problems you should attend to, oh, you need to, you need to paint outside and you need to, you need to fix the handrail here, but, but you have termites in your foundation and nobody's telling you that, and you go on for years like that, the house is going to be corrupted, Right? And so that's what I mean. They're treasonous tribal lovers. Who in the culture now, I'm, I'm asking you, Emerson, right, who in the culture now is looking out and highlighting the actual problems, not pseudo problems? That's the question. Well, you know who it is? It's people like Melissa I mentioned, like Alex Craner, like all these people, like Dr. <laughs> Tess Lowry over there in the UK who speak that, mm -hmm. spoke up for ivermectin during all this insanity with the COVID a few years ago. That's where, mm -hmm. and that's, see, that's the thing is, because you, you, you bring up, I'm looking at the book and I'm looking at this trust your eyes under experience and, and I think, you know, you, I, I'm probably being redundant from my comment before, but you can really look at that two ways um, because to me it gets into your, to trusting your eyes but trusting your heart and, and some of these basic principles about look at the fruits. You know, and, mm -hmm. and there are just people who clearly, you know, you see it say one thing, but the actions go a different way. Um, and I've seen that yeah. in the work I do. I mean, our industry, the financial services industry, big surprise. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. corruption at every level. And what I'm finding is, is I start getting down to these levels of smaller companies that operate on a different playing field are actually places where you're starting to get different views and get, a, you know, a break from a narrative. Um, same thing mm -hmm. with religious organizations, you know, um, it's one thing to talk about principles and living up to a higher standard, but when you, you know, I mean, these are biblical things. If you can't even, you know, handle the small responsibilities of the world, which, you know, it, you know, you can't, mm -hmm. shouldn't be trusted with the keys to the kingdom to, you know, act as a mouthpiece for God. And so I think there's an awakening because, you know, I, and I guess maybe this is the question for you as a person who's dug into this. Um, and maybe my point is I'm going, you'll find I go in circles with this stuff, but I'm finding that um, connecting with people all over the world, all over the country, you start to realize, you know, you start to get your own truth, you know, from the experiences of others and who are seeing things too that are similar. And then you start building on it and, and you start to realize the depth of all this, you know? Um, and, right. and so that's, I guess the hope, um, but that's a good point. Anybody, people in positions of authority right now, by and large, you know, I, I mean, I don't listen to these. I can't last, remember the last time I turned on. Yeah, I can't yeah. either. It's, it's right. And, and you know, and yeah. even like Zero Hedge, I think we may have talked about that. That's a financial blog. And, you know, you go in there and, and there's certain still things that are, you know, you, you have to sift. And I think that's my question to you is it because I read this and I thought, my God. 
we've really given away, you know, are we, are we just trusting souls that are, are naturally inclined to want to give people the benefit of the doubt and have been completely taken, o- taken advantage of? Um, and so, it's, on one hand, it's like, God, this seems so basic in a lot of ways, and yet we've all been, you know, just completely surrendered to it for so long. I'll speak for myself up until I woke up four years ago during the whole COVID. Um, mm-hmm. but so on one hand, it seems like it's, it's, it's insidious, but we've also given over our, our free will or our trust so easily. Um, maybe that's the question is, is just, why is that? You know? And then the other side of it is, is, is it simply for money and power? Is that what this all boils down to that the other side of this is, is why they're taking, you know, people are so are taken advantage of? Well, it certainly is about money and power. I mean, I think it's always been right. Uh, Because that's as old as the garden, right? But I think one of the things about truth is, you know, there's this saying, truth will out, right? And initially, um, very, very powerful forces are at work to try to submerge truth at this point. And they have a lot of the control mechanisms of the culture, right? So current truth is difficult. it, it, It contains a cost to dig up. Like, literally, it's a time and sometimes a financial cost. And some people have lost their lives trying to dig out the truth, yeah. correct? So there is a, a s- serious cost to trying to get truth at, in a live time, all right? Right, live, live time. So, like, now, current truth. So why I, you know, encourage people to look historically because, to me, the gems are lying on the ground much more easily accessible. They've been dug up um, to a certain degree. Like, for example... One of the things when um, I wrote a blog about Crozier, which is Al Crozier, he was trying to expose the banker's plan to get the Federal Reserve, right? And he um, he was battling against them, and they created a front group called the National Citizens League for the Promotion of Sound Banking. And um, <laughs> they, they say, you know, in communications in a box somewhere in in Harvard now this this lady went in and 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 they're saying yeah we we started this this front group right so it's there it's 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 ready to be picked up and carried forward right so a lot of the the truth has come out people have dug the work up right um, historically and you can you can gather that a lot easier and it's non polarizing right now we're in such a highly polarizing environment that it's almost you can't even talk to people. So what I, I, I kind of come from an apolitical position, yeah. try to bring people back historically and say, look, like, so one of the, so in exposing that Crozier um, versus the bankers thing, there was a New York Times article that spelled out exactly what that um, front group was intended to do. And this is, this shocked me because I didn't include it in the book, but it was 1911, and the New York Times article laid out Everything that they did in the the war seven years later or so, um, they basically said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna do um, well." First of all, they made sure that the company was corporated in the Midwest because the bankers said if they understand that this is from us, they'll reject it immediately. So hated were the bankers, mm. the Northeast bankers, and so um, sure enough, they incorporated in the Midwest. It was all Midwest people, but of course they were uh, aligned with the bank, right, or the bank, the Northeast bankers. And what they did was they had forty. They had chapters in forty-two states. They created an entire network. They created simplified material that would be distributed freely. They used a half a million dollars or more. They created a speakers bureau. They targeted some things to the populace, some things to intelligentsia. They had books, symposium, and and El Crozier had a book. He was a lawyer. He could he could he could he could diagnose what they were saying in the Aldrich plan, and and he was a you know some somewhat a conversant with financial um, things. So he basically said, here's section A one or whatever, and then he did the interpretation. This is what they're going to be able to do. When you read this book, it's shocking. You're like we gave we gave the house away during the Federal Reserve, right? And so. Um, Anyways, he exposes it, but he's got one book, he's got a little bit of money, um, and he doesn't have much to get his message out, because the news isn't going to cover him. 
right? So, so that's sort of, you know, that's kind of what we're fighting against too, because this, this, how to get this message out, right? We're getting censored on the internet now. And, and so truth is, it's, it's going to have to come from us. It's going to have, we're going to have to open our mouths. We're going to have to share things and widely distribute because there's nobody else going to, to help us with this. All the power and money and effort is going to submerge the truth from the top down. And it's, it, does that make sense? So I encourage people to go back, look historically. And if you can, if you can see how much propaganda was going on in the 1900s, you can just extrapolate it out. You don't even have to look at that middle section of history and you go, well, of course they've just progressed. Does that make sense? It does. They never stopped using it. It just accelerated, accelerated until, until most of what we're, we're, we're being told is just a mirage. And you know, what we're seeing, driving. I mean, you throw onto what you're right. talking about and then you add CGI to it. I mean, right. it, you know, I, I saw, I mean, I'm not, you know, a techie guy, but I saw a little video about, you know, showing a little kid who looks like he's walking on the edge of a fence and going to fall into like a, you know, a, a drop uh -huh. off on the street. And then the real picture is it's just CGI and it's just like it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pavement there you can't see because of the altering. And so... It's like when you brought up in the beginning in the World War One ep chapter about mm -hmm. the pictures of you know showing the dead Germans but not the French. I think, I mean, it's like yeah. this this soundbite, you know, and you start, and then that's what I'm saying, and, and you've articulated, but you start realizing that that has been refined, <laughs> that ability, you know, this soundbite world. Yeah. Oh my God. You know, it's like almost how, how do you stand a chance? You know, if you're completely right. relying on, as you said here, what you, you know, trust your eyes. And then you add on, and I've got to go through these real quick, imagination, trust your culture, right? So you're trusting these people mm -hmm. around you who then you jump to this other one that's in here, social pressure, trust what others are saying and doing. You know, everybody wants to fit. I mean, I've just naturally been a contrarian. I think you shared that. But, you know, somewhere, yeah. I mean, that's just, I've always gone against the grain just for another reason that it just felt right to not just dive in with everybody, you know, then authority, you know, then, so then in this group of social pressure and culture, you've got these people that are put on a pedestal, you know, for a bunch of reasons, whether it's their, you know, family, familial relations or their wealth or the power. I mean, it's all the usual stuff um, or the letters after their name, whatever it might be. And then you, yeah, right. right. You know, the celebrities endorsing stuff. I mean, right. But I have to tell you, it, and I, there's a couple other things. Gosh, I'm already half hour into this. I can't believe it. Um, I, I, don't you feel like, and, and this is the the like appeal to to people who are trying to figure stuff out in their own life, that deep down, somewhere in here, you know, I'm a I'm a you know, I'll say I'm a spiritual guy. That's probably better. But I believe in God, and I believe that God's in here, and I believe that there's this conscience, there's a spirit of truth, whatever you want to call it. That testifies that it's almost like all this stuff has been designed to block us from ourselves. Does that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And because I think deep yeah. down we all know we can see things. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I've shared this on other interviews um, that there is certainly a, a, a fear or a hurdle to literally shelving all the beliefs you've ever had in life. You know, I mean, literally mm -hmm. starting from scratch, um, untethering, right? But yeah. when you do that, at least for me, it's been, and my wife would say the same thing, and I'm, I, I discern that from reading your book, is it's freeing. There's a freedom mm -hmm. when you get to start over, when you get to start um, with your own menu. You know, I, there's this, I mentioned this one last thing, and I'll, I'll ask you to just share your thoughts on this, but there's this book, um, The Four Agreements, and one of the first ones it, it talks about is this, Tol it's this Toltec philosophy that um but they talk about you know we come into this world thinking we have a freedom of choice yet the menu's already been printed you know we think mm -hmm. we get we're choosing because you know i choose to be this religion versus that or i choose to you know believe this versus that but the point of it is is it's all still there in a box we're picking stuff out of you right and when you can jump right. outside of that and all of a sudden you're starting completely from scratch um, and that almost seems like the extreme that we have to go to at this point, at least to me. And, and I don't know, does that sound right? I mean, I'm sure there's things that are sacred, but you really got to go to some base core inside beliefs, to, you, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, to, to sift through all this. Well, I think, yeah, I think one of the things that helped me 
was, and, and we are sort of wired this way, but of course it's getting sort of de-emphasized, but wired to see difference, right? So when things come in, and, and so um, part of being a contrarian is seeing patterns that don't, don't seem right. You know, so like I mentioned in the book about this Elizabeth Obagi, right? And she was the Syrian expert. Yep. And I said, I went, you're 20, you're like 25 to 30. You're, you're a good looking younger woman. You're not going to be, you're not going to be an expert in the Syrian culture. You're just not. There, there, there was just something that's, so instead of just leaving it and walking away, I start to pull on the threads. All right. So I look up where she's coming from. Oh, because she's coming from the Institute of the Study of War. Well, that's a very hawkish um, if you look at who funds them, follow the yeah. money, it's Northrop Grumman, it's, it's a, a, you know, uh, Raytheon, etc. And the people at the head of the organization are all retired ex-military. Okay, so then I leave that alone, I, I, and, and in, into my senses come, again, um, the fact that she falsified her PhD, right? And, and it, it untangled, without getting too deep into that story, because it'll probably take us a little while, um, you know, things start to emerge. So I, I want to encourage the audience to, to s things that come up as a pattern that, that look funny to you, explore, pull on those threads because it's part of deconstructing, you know what I mean? Because you can't go down like you're talking about starting over and jumping out of the box. Well, some of it, part, it you, you're deconstructing it in part over time, right? So pull on those threads, mm. things that look unusual to you. Like, when I saw um, coronavirus coming up on the horizon, I'm like, this looks like a marketing rollout to me, right? Because it was too coordinated. Uh, things, things just capitulated in a domino fashion outside of real life. Like, think about it. If you have, like, family in for an um, extended weekend and you, you want to decide where to go to eat, you know, and one person says, oh, well, we can go over here. Oh, that's going in the opposite direction. I'm going to have to drive home. And another one says, well, how about Chinese? Oh, I had Chinese yesterday. And you know what I mean? You, you go through this 20-minute conversation to decide where, where are we going to go to eat, yeah. right? It's, uh, you know, and so in a society with all kinds of conflicts of interest, there should have been a huge dialogue at the direction the country took you know, based on, well, we can't do this for the kids. This is going to be bad for the kids, and they're not really a threat here. And... You know what I mean? But everybody just like rolled over like a domino. That to me looked highly unnatural. There's no way a society does that unless there's some sort of planning and coordination amongst the super organizations that are uh, extending pressure down to the, the lower lower ranks. Does that make Completely, sense? Completely, yes. Okay, yeah. So, so I just, you know, just encouraging people to see patterns, things that don't fit right, pull on the threads ask more questions and you're going to be, you know, and again, uh, you know, you go back to your idea of the, the spiritual and asking, asking for instructions, you know what I mean? Seeking, seeking knowledge outside yourself. And I talk about this in the domain of knowledge, like there's two domains of knowledge. Um, we're, we've been enculturated to be rank materialists. There's nothing that exists except for like this physical table in front of me, your mm -hmm. microphone, etc. Right. And, and, and facts should inform what you do. And in fact, that's not true. We have a whole series of values, all right? And our values come from the humanities. It comes from what is truth. What should we, what is, what is man all about? What are his highest goods? How should he orient himself in the world? How should he orient himself to his neighbor? All those things are in the humanities. They're in stories, they're in myths, they're in religions, they're in p poetry, right? But we de-emphasized humanities and it comes through hearing. You, can, you, you have to talk about these things. They don't, you can't examine the physical structure of the world and come up with values. They have to be talked through. So, so, so the domain of truth is in verbal expression. Does that, is that, I know that's kind of a deeper concept. No, you know what you're I mean? You're right. You actually reminded me of something. My son and I went to uh, Eastern Greenland in 2019, and one of the parts of the trip was we went to this island called Tina Tekalak, <laughs> and this uh. and it was 80 people, and we sat in the mayor's uh -huh. living room, and you know <laughs> uh, we're a little tour group it was with NatHab, so there's a plug for that. But um, we okay. sat there, and, and through a translator, he was explaining how. Um, 
the history, and I kind of gleaned this from parts of the tour where, you know, the, the, the Danish, I believe, are the ones that settled um, Greenland and basically came in with their, you know, the church and effectively destroyed all the culture, you know, you know, their, their traditions. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about in that, you, and then of course now I'm seeing the, you know, the insidiousness of that because it all gets back to what you're talking about, which is you start disconnecting people from these roots, these stories. I mean, my wife's a quarter Hawaiian, you know, these myths and tales yeah. are a part of the culture that help people connect mm -hmm. to the world. And, and so it, it's, you're right. It is these are the things that are important, um, and I, I guess I just come away, you know, like I said, with this discussion and reading this book, that, you know, and I've already felt this, but the days of waiting to be told what to do by other people are over. You know, we're mm -hmm. done. Yeah. You know, it, it is absolutely right. on each and every one of us to do our own work, to, to right. have conversations, to read, and to just navigate our way through. Um, and and like I've mentioned before, I just go back to certain things that have happened in my life that can't be explained materially like you mm -hmm. said better mm -hmm. coincidence mm -hmm. is whatever you want to call it that for me in my life the hand of god i mean my interview with john waters the last we had you know what we found out it, it about 40 minutes in or 20 i don't know midway mm -hmm. through the interview is we both got sober in aa i mean <laughs> this guy in ireland okay. right yeah. and so you start to see these connections and things and you yeah. start realizing there is a greater force working here and that's you know, again, I don't mean to start preaching, but that to me is where you have to, you know, we, I, uh, for me, tap into that truth because then all the rest of mm -hmm. it's going to fall, um, which is where the hope is. Now, I know we're almost running out of time here, but I, I wanted to ask, because you mentioned um, in an email, you've done a little research on uh, the American Red Cross. And I just thought, you know, if you've got any things to share with, because I, one thing I have learned too, and I mean, these, these bigger organizations, you know, it's kind of like you said um, or alluded to earlier, you know, it's not just some, it, you have to also look at guilt by association. I think when you start seeing these patterns of these organizations, you know, the UN is clearly mm -hmm. not looking out for the best interest of anybody. Well, right. let's right. talk about most of us, the, the lower levels of the world here. Um, and then, you know, you mm -hmm. connect these com you know, companies, organizations, you start to see the connections there. Um, what have you, you know, is there anything you feel like comfortable well, sharing? Well, think about, yeah, think about, um, you know, overall, the, these people are, are so, um, you know, and if you want to talk about light and dark, you know, goodness and, and evil, you know, the evil isn't original in any way. It, it infiltrates, it, it mimics the good, right? And so they infiltrate good things, right? And, and so I, I was reading, a, and again, it was a wonderful book by a gal who had done an extended dissertation on the origins of, of um, the Red Cross. And if you go back to the Civil War, um, it was Edith Barton who sort of um, started the, the, the Red Cross, American Red Cross here <clears throat> in the States. And um, going into the turn of the century, um, the, you see her getting up in age. And um, uh, it looked to me like other, you know, <laughs> you know that, that core group, you know, kind of cannibalized her highly trusted organization. Right, there is trust. We could get into something that's trusted by the American people, right? So they, any, anyways, they, they insert this 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 socialite Mabel Broadman into uh, the organizational structure, and she ends up turning and accusing Edith Barton of fraud, or you know, like mismanaging the resources. And they were, you know, really live time. Like let's get the let's get the money to the people. And so that, you know, she was probably not quite keeping track but she was a very honest person so it wasn't a problem but she ends up you know uh having to go before a congressional committee you know to you know it, it just crushed her in her 80s right mm. so she gets pushed out and she gets pushed out um and they incorporate and they become a quasi-governmental organization right and the first major disaster that they encounter um after she's pushed out is the great fire, um, earthquake and fire of San Francisco. And so they're sort of like, well, without our lead person, what are we going to do? So they bring some people in from New York and, and um, they ate, basically took in all this money and they slow walked it out the door, right? And so they, they actually um, gave loans to people instead of charitable gifts. Um, they had t ended up having two lawsuits brought against them um, for not distributing the money in a fair and you know equitable way uh, uh at the end of the 
the uh, disaster period, and they were upheld because they said, you know, the people of, of the United States wanted that money to be charitable, but you've made it like you're, you're making money off of it. And they sat on a whole bunch of it and created the first endowment for the American Red Cross. And um, what you find a little later on is they create this palatial, and that's their words, um, uh, building for the Red Cross in the two years before the war. Okay, mm, interesting, right? And in the war, Ivy Lee, who's a public relations expert that was used by Rockefeller uh, to kind of paper over the Ludlow massacre, if you remember, um, the Pinkertons just kind of came came in and mowed everybody down. It was a real, real PR disaster for Rockefeller. Ivy Lee sort of smoothed that over. He gets ceded to the... Um, the the the, corp, the American Red Cross Corporation, and as well as Henry Davison, who was the, the right hand man to J P Morgan, now is is running the organization in Washington. Mm. So I mean, and and then there are some other things I won't get into those, but um, it's an interesting, and you know, like recently, American Cross Red Cross has been accused of lots of money laundering and not you know, not getting the money to the people. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with a lot of the scandals in, in some of the major, um, you know, like the, like the Haiti stuff and, you know what I mean, people give there and they don't, it doesn't get to the people. But I believe that they were, you know, again, you can insinuate yourself into things that are highly trusted and, and that's a way to get at money and get at opportunities in other countries. Mm. Um, it's a very, it's something that I'm, I'm kind of working on for the next book, actually. Um, yeah, you just actually <laughs> said a mouthful with, with, because, you know, the idea of people giving their money, hoping to expect the people, but in turn, the trusted mm -hmm. institution, you know, having their own ideas about what to do with it and explaining it away. Um, yeah. Well, it become, it become corporatized. Right. In essence, well, with the changeover from Edith Barton, and nobody knew, you know, nobody really recognized that. So all of a sudden, it really be almost been taken over by hostile forces who didn't have that genuine concern for the people. And now it was an institution. Um, and you can look at too. You have, if you sit back and look at the war, the propaganda that you know, think about PR campaigns. Um, the people themselves were sold the war idea, right? But they were also sold, there were, there were four different campaigns for the Liberty Loans, okay? Liberty Loan 1, 2, 3, 4. They were d done in different subscriptions. There was a Victory Loan publicity campaign. There were two American Red Cross campaigns. So not only are the people, because these were bonds, think about it, Emerson. These were bonds. You're investing in a war. How horrific is that? I'm going to make money. Like they were offered 3 to 5%. Um, or 3.5 percent. I'm sorry. Um, that's just not a good thing, right? You shouldn't be investing in war, right? But but people, so they were petitioned to. They had to offer their money. Of their of course, they're sending their blood and treasures already, right? Now they're being asked to fund the war. Then they're, now they're being asked, well, you have to also fund the Red Cross, so you're going to fund the support for your injured soldiers as well. And at the end, they did a campaign called the United War Work. And that was a combination of organizations like the the YMCA and some like a Jewish and Catholic group. But they were funding the troops staying in for an occupation season. So like like for a year, a year and a half, they were still stationed um, in Europe, and they were uh, you know giving them entertainment and things to do uh, to spend their time while they were an occupation force. And so so and the people were asked to pay for each one of those things, incredibly. You know, so, you know, not only did they lose their lives, but they were asked to do all those things. So, so we haven't talked about this, but there was huge backlash after the war to what had mm -hmm. been done. People sort mm -hmm. of realized, you know, when the, when, you know, it wasn't the war to end all wars, right? And uh, things panned out quite differently than what, what they were told. And, uh, you know, of course, people who came back filtered, talked about what happened in the war and the type of trench warfare, hor horrible warfare that it was. And so, you know, there was a huge backlash, a lot of interest in propaganda and what had been done um, in America at that time. But it basically, in that interwar period, um, you know, by the time the World War II came around, um, it, it went underground because it was so um, wedded to the image of enemy propaganda. 
and it almost it almost disappeared into the midst. Like Americans didn't do propaganda after World War II. It was the just enemy. the communist. Yeah. The enemy. This is the enemy did it. We don't do it at all. We've never done it. We've been doing it for almost 50 years now, but we don't do it at all. It's just Germany, Russia, and whoever happens to be the enemy against us at the time. Yeah, I tell you what, um, I could talk to you all day about this stuff because as, as you're talking, I'm just thinking more and more and more. I mean, even in my work, you know, I've been in financial services now for almost 40 years. And this may seem little, but just the realization, I had a, a municipal bond m uh, manager on, I don't know, a year or so ago, and it never occurred to me that, you know, when you buy tax-free bonds, you know, you're, there's a specific purpose to it, building a hospital, fixing the roads, an airport. Right. Government bonds, <laughs> what does it do? It goes to the government, and they do whatever they want with it. Corporate, it's the same thing, mm -hmm. and you start realizing, you know, and that's what kind of speaks to what you said. Maybe this is a good place to end, but... There is an accountability. People have to start mm -hmm. holding these organizations and these people accountable. And it's it started with people's where they spend their money, where they don't. You know, you start to see these product boycotts and things. Yeah. And but, you know, you know, the government have they earned the trust of just you giving them money to to let them you know do what they see with? Uh, not to me, they haven't. I mean, you know, and any of my right. clients listening to this won't be shocked to hear me say that. But it's you know, and so. There is an awakening. Um, you're certainly your book has a role in that. Um, so I know, and I've one more time for those who are watching. One idea to rule them all. Um, you have a website, smartsheep.com. Yeah. Smartsheep.com. It's sheep with an e in the end. It's an old English. Poem. Yeah. So, um, I, and I guess just last thing. Any final thoughts? When do you expect your next publication to come out? Because I'm excited to. Uh, <laughs> to dig into it um i i don't really know i can't put a yeah. timetable on that i mean still working on other things i still have a job you know but um i do want to mention to people yeah. is they can i mean no one's getting this information out but you and i as you alluded to earlier right i mean it's up to us nobody's coming no no person on a white horse is coming to save us you right. know what i mean and we've got to share with others we've got to open our mouth we've got to attend to those things pull on the threads but one of the way that that i i've endeavored to do this and help people is to i created a study guide with the book um you can get that together on my website as a bundle you can't buy it through uh amazon as a bundle right so you get a little cheaper cut rate right and teach your kids at the very least sit down with them i mean this is this is made as a like a 12-week mm. course that you could do you could do it you could you could lengthen it out depending on your schedule or whatever but um sit down with them you'll learn as much or more than your kids and you'll you'll go back in history you'll you'll understand the patterns and once you start seeing the patterns it becomes so much easier to dissect them when they're around you and and you know jumping into american propaganda as it is right now is a is a highly complex 21st century absolute weapon they they have honed you know down to a you know the finest thread right and so it's very difficult to insert yourself at that point and to understand things you know so it's like saying you know anything really complicated you don't jump into college you know residency with a medical school and that's what it is I mean, you're asking people to dissect a propaganda at this point because there's so many different uh you know controlled oppositions and what they're doing on the internet and it's you would take an enormous amount of time. Go back. Go back to history. It's much easier to learn. It's much un easier to understand. And then you can you can fill in the blanks, and then you're you're set to, to start growing in your your propaganda IQ for current events, right? You know, because we, we it's becoming almost life preserving to uh, be able to understand and map out the environment. Well, well right? put. Yeah, and I would just reiterate something we talked about before we started and that is um again the infrastructure of belief if anybody spends any time those those five things alone i think are pretty eye-opening because you see the threads and the and the tentacles of that whole kind of structure in you know you can permeate everything and you, once you see that tie it to the history like you right. said and remember you know, it's not techniques it's trust in a democracy they <laughs> impregnate and permeate right or you know right they get into the trusts that's what they do and so if you thinking like for, for example you think well i'll just learn logic and reason and it'll help me from being betrayed in a relationship like you would go of course it's not because why can you be betrayed in a relationship because you trust them that's when betrayal is if you don't trust them you don't feel that betrayed right yeah 
you feel betrayed when you trust. And so you got to remember right and left. And, and, you know, Creel said this, it's like, they, they know how to control one side and the other. Like, I'll just speak your language, but then I'll get my information through you as well as the left side or the right side, right? And so um, they're not, you know, they're not trying to impact the people on the right through CNN. And, and conversely, they're not trying to impact the people on the left through Fox News, okay? But they're impacting both sides because they own a lot of the... Uh, you know, the digital space influencing both sides. Let's be honest. You know what I mean? So that's where, you know, that's a very hard place to start. So I say, just go yeah. back and take it one step at a time, learn it from its foundation and realize that it's the trusts that are being infected. And remember, what it, what was the one thing they went on? A, 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 I think it was um, um, a late night comedy show. And what was the first thing that they said about um, coronavirus? They said, we're going to find out. This is a big experiment. Are people going to trust the science? Mm. So politicians have no trust left, right? The news media has no trust left. And so medical doctors and science still had a lot of trust. Now, that's really been blown up in, to a large degree after coronavirus. But they were using that. It, intentionally so. People still trust science. I mean, that's it's apolitical. It's pristine. There's no agenda there. Just trust the mm. science. And people people did. <clears throat> well, as has been said, and I think it bears repeating, trust has to be earned. It's not just given. Yeah. And I think, anyway, right. um, Michelle, I want to just thank you for your time. Thank you for taking the time to write this book. It's great. Um, and I just appreciate you joining me on, on Upthinking Finance today. Well, thank you so much. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Emerson Fersh is a registered representative with and securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC. Advisor services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from Capital Investment Advisors. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. The guest speakers and the companies they represent are not affiliated with or endorsed by LPL Financial or Capital Investment Advisors. Individual tax and legal matters should be discussed with your tax or legal expert. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. There is no assurance that the techniques and strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. The purchase of certain securities may be required to affect some of the strategies. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal.